acting chair of the United National Congress, and uh, I want to say how pleased I am to be with this department once again, because I have shared uh, on the front sides of the table as a member of the audience, as well as a panelist, in several discussions, including women in politics, women in leadership, and here I am today. I continue to support your work in this department, and uh, I, as we go forward, I, you know, I, I sat there reflecting as both speakers um, shared. And it just came to my mind that there was a time in our country, in our history, when it was unthinkable that Negro slaves would have one day been allowed human rights and the ability to vote. And we also moved later on to a period when women who did not have the right to vote, when even when they were given the right to vote, had to wait until they were much older to vote. And today, all of those hurdles have been crossed. And I am sure that uh, as we continue to advance as a society, many of the other hurdles will be crossed. And uh, I was happy to hear Joelle share on her experience and the perception of the leadership of various political parties. Let me tell you that the aim of any political party in any country generally, is to win election, to win government. And uh, to court different agendas would be part of getting support from different backgrounds. The political parties first look at their electorate, the constituency, but of course, having particular candidates in different constituencies these candidates comprise a national slate. And this national slate should, ideally, appeal to every background in the country. In a cosmopolitan country like ours, it means that you have to be very particular. There are other countries where, generally, they're, you know, they're a little less varied than we are. But in this country, and in countries as cosmopolitan as ours, political, political parties strive to have every race, every religion, various professions, various backgrounds represented in general. What this means is that the interests of that particular background would be advocated for within different spaces. So whether it is in parliament, whether it is in the cabinet, whether it is in the opposition caucus. The type of policy you would put forward or support, all of those things, it is expected that the people who come from those different backgrounds would advocate. So, for example, the network of NGOs have been working with women, young women across the country, and they would expect that when some of those women become elected persons, for instance, you, they support them through elections in different political parties, but they expect that when they go there, they will not only be a woman in office, but they would advocate for gender issues. And so that applies to almost every area of interest that the person who represents should represent the interest of that group. In our country, though, People like Joel and people who are brave enough to be independent candidates don't fare well because we often put party first. The candidate is secondary. There are unique instances when candidates are well known and very popular in the constituency and best suited to win. Independent candidates depend more on personality and their personal relations within the constituency. And I know Joel is well known in San Fernando. So, very often, a political party would choose a candidate and expect the electorate to vote for party first. What you have emerging um, is 
we, you have two views to look at, the view of the constituency and the view of people nationally. Nationally, both nationally and in the constituency, people can be tolerant, so they may not endorse homosexuality per se, but they do not object to a person carrying on a lifestyle of their choice. So they judge you based on your character. There are those who are non-tolerant. Anything that condones LGBT, they are against it. And very often, this is, these tend to be people who are religious advocates and who are strongly rooted in um, not any particular, I, I don't want to call any particular religion, but those who are religious advocates tend to be very much against. There are those who are very liberal. They do not share the lifestyle, they don't support the cause, but they don't discriminate either. So that freedom of choice and so on is up to you. And I think that those type of people allow us to, um, to welcome candidates from different walks of life. But again, we tend to be a very conservative society. And the expectations of uh, people in public office in general, there's a certain stereotype, and when we discuss women in politics, um, we often touch on this, um, and I myself would have experienced it. People want to see a candidate who is really middle of the line. They want to see a person who has led a conservative lifestyle. They want to see a person, man or woman, who is a high achiever, who has an unblemished record as far as they can tell. They want to see someone who comes from a typical family, who themselves is involved in a typical family, and who fit a typical gender rule. That is the thing that will get you middle of the line, score the highest points. But in my experience, while people from different walks of life have managed to be involved in politics and portray this conservative image. The fact is that there have been many persons who have been gay and holding public office without it be their sexuality being publicly known. And so it, even where people know what they look at is not so much that person's sexual preference, but the characteristics that they embody. If you are male, there are typical characteristics that you expect from a person who is offering themselves to run for office. They expect that all these typical masculine features that you would carry. So, it, so from my perspective, it is not only based on a person's sexual preference, but based on their portrayal of their character. And I have experienced men who are straight, but they find a little too softy. They find that, they, and the constituents will tell you, and they call me as acting chairman of the party, and they say, we find our candidate, he not masculine enough. What is masculine enough? Do you believe this person could represent your interest? Yes. Do you believe this person could articulate well in Parliament? Yes. Do you think this person can touch on every space in the community and collaborate with people and consult with different interests? Yes. Do you think this person could represent you? Because we have offered you a representative. And the answer is yes. But their problem, now mind you, this is in a UNC stronghold, their problem is that their perception of the candidate is that he's not masculine enough. So even in cases of women who are very strong women, regardless of their, pol their sexual orientation, whether they are straight or whether they are heterosexual or homosexual, women also face this challenge. And many of us, well, as women in politics, we discuss it. They really, the public wants to see a woman who fits a typical rule.
So, pointy tip shoes are better than blunt tip shoes, you know? <laughs> because we always reach to your shoes. But in terms of your lifestyle, in terms of your family life in particular, you are placed under scrutiny. And women, regardless, and I'm saying regardless of their sexual preference, face the criticism in terms of what is typically expected of a woman. So if you believe that you are a career person, you want to study, you want to research, you want to postpone having a family, you are at the risk as, as you get older of being criticized for not being a woman. If you choose, God forbid, to have children out of marriage, oh Lord, everybody else doing it, you know. But if you are a woman in public office and you make a decision to have children outside of marriage, it becomes an issue for all of those critics who themselves may have children who have children outside of marriage. And so as we go forward, I believe that all of these issues are wrapped in one. The media will play a very significant role in how issues are perceived when it comes to persons in public office in general. I think with regards to this issue, the media in the 2015 general election uh, was very politically correct. While I did see one clip where an attempt was made to make fun of a candidate, uh, says there are also many LG LGBT persons in the media. So that could account for, the fa for why the media was um, a little less criticizing. Um, I, I, I'm sure some information, some research could be done on that, but that's just my perception. But there's social media, where nobody has to be responsible. Where people say what they want, they attack you, they, I mean, it's, it's their account. And social media is where I believe we really see um, the best and worst of it. Um, people have a voice on social media that is unchecked. There have been attacks on candidates' accounts on Facebook. Um, there are anti-gay comments and sentiments against candidates that spiral onto the party. And the discussion moves away from the candidate and goes on to the political party. So while Joelle may have indicated that she felt um, that we were a little more liberal, a little more compassionate in, under one political regime, let me tell you that there's a political price for that. For any political party who is compassionate to the LGBT cause, the reality is that there is the other voice that will object to the agenda. And that voice often comes out, for example, when we have consultations on con constitution reform and so on. And that is also a reality that political parties try to toe the line and walk in the middle because you want to balance the support from both opposing sides. I know of candidates who were attacked, verbally attacked, on walkabouts, um, attacked in person. Thankfully, it was only verbally. I'm not aware of any physical, vi physically violent attacks. I know of instances where posters, banners, flyers, and even offices of candidates were, um, were vandalized, and the graffiti clearly indicated the reason for the vandalism. But generally, um, nationally, you would have seen sympathy towards that candidate and the cause. And let me tell you, let me state as I wrap up, that the position of the United National Congress remains that we stand against any form of discrimination. The, ha the under the UNC would have had an increased number of women in government and I feel that we had a better representation of the cosmopolitan Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and you are right, 
Robinson, it is not only about race, creed, and geographic location. Um, issues with regards to a balance in race um, and people's background, their academic, professional, and grassroots background, as well as their sexual orientation, come into question. And I feel that um, our political leader had done a good job of balancing all those interests so that the voice could be heard um, in the places, the most hallowed halls of decision making. Um, and I say that the work to remove all forms of discrimination, the issue of same, um, the, the, the removal of all forms of discrimination is something that we can all accept, but the issue of same-sex marriages remains controversial in our country, and I think we, it is important to look at the human rights issues first and then make the next step forward. I thank you very much for listening to me.